Welcome to the Sailing Into Oblivion podcast, where we hear stories from everyday people who do extraordinary things. I'm your host, Jerome Rand. Hey, before we begin, just want to give a shout out to some of the listeners uh, out there in New Mexico, working out there at Sky, and uh, to the Kiwis and my brothers. Hopefully you guys are doing well and going to get the next thing up in the air. Thanks for listening. All right, guys, we are live back on Mighty Sparrow here in wonderful Rockland, Maine. And this one may be a bit of a shorter podcast, but we'll see. Depends on how how in-depth I get. But I wanted to just really give an update to everybody on what's going on and where I'm headed to and how the planning and uh, all the setup is going on. So uh, this is all about this this upcoming voyage that I'm I'm about to head out on. So... Buckle up. It's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> so for those of you that uh, don't know, uh, sort of where I've been sailing and stuff like that. So 2017-18, I did uh, circumnavigation from the U.S. down around the world and then right back up. And it was a solo nonstop. And uh, then I attempted to do a circumnavigation of the Americas. Uh, last year in 2020, which got foiled about 21 days into the trip when the Canadians told me I could no longer have access to the Arctic. So uh, that one just was 68 days or 66 days, something like that. Um, No, it was longer than that. I don't know. I can't even remember. But it's basically a 10,000 mile trip around the Atlantic during uh, the hurricane season. So not exactly what I was planning on doing, but uh, an adventure all the same. So now, uh, because I, I guess, I guess part of me really wants to get back out there because I don't want a sort of screwed up trip to be one of my final adventures aboard Mighty Sparrow, and uh, and I really want to. Just get back out there because I miss I miss the freedom, <laughs> being out on the ocean and and just that connection and and that that disconnect from all the cell phones and all the all that sort of stuff that uh, takes up so much of my time when I'm here on land. So uh, basically, there's there's it's kind of an interesting trip. So the outline of it, so to speak, as far as where I'm going, the plan. So today's October 1st. The plan is to have the boat ready by October 20th and be able to set sail pretty much right after that uh, as early as I can. Um, But the game plan is to leave from somewhere up here, either in Maine or Rhode Island or Massachusetts, whatever the weather sort of lets me do. Because I I'm, I'm going to be looking for a nice window to uh, maybe ride the tail end of a a nice little little system coming off a of Hatteras or something like that and get way out into the Atlantic past the Gulf Stream and then then make my way down towards the equator. Uh, that should take usually about a month and then blast on down to uh, Cape Horn from there. So that one's a a bit of a a bit of a jaunt as far as mileage goes, but because uh, you have to go basically from the equator all the way down to 57 degrees south to get there, but uh, past the Falkland Islands and all that sort of stuff. The nice part is for the first few thousand miles, it's all nice, steady uh, southeast trade winds, so I'll be able to actually move pretty quickly. And the game plan is to try to get to Cape Horn right in the middle of January, pretty good month to be down there uh, less intensity of of crazy strong gales and uh, see if we can get this old boat to uh, make it around there and I think you know I, I've watched that weather enough to know that it's not just constant westerlies it's a lot of different systems so there are there are going to be opportunities to sort of worm my way through. I mean, no doubt I'm going to get bashed like crazy. Um, 
And there is definitely that possibility that, uh, you know, I go the way of Captain Bly and can't, you know, spend like a month down there trying to get around the horn and never actually do it and finally just decide to to go the other way. But um, if I'm lucky and everything holds up and uh, and the weather cooperates and everything like that, then basically head into the Pacific, get a little bit north, get out of the Southern Ocean, and then I'll be making my way on a long trek uh, to spot an island called Howland Island. And this one lies right on the equator, way, way deep into the Pacific, almost due north of New Zealand. Um, but this is an island has a little bit of family history. So way, way back, mid-1800, uh, my great-great-great-grandfather, who was, I believe, the second mate on one of the ships that was in the phosphates trade. So they were they were leaving Europe, going around the Horn backwards, collecting all the bird guano, uh, the petrified stuff, to bring back to fertilize the fields. And so he was doing that. And when he was a second mate, they filled up with a bunch of stuff. And then supposedly they, they came across Howland Island. And it was either Howland Island or Baker Island. But uh, one of the two, and basically found that it, it had tons of stuff on it. And so rather, but because the boat was already full, they decided rather than uh, uh, just abandon it completely, they left my distant relative and uh, another person. So they left two people on the island with a, a ton of supplies and uh, said, we'll sail back to England and then we'll we'll come back and get you. And about nine or ten months later, another ship came by, and uh, a different ship, and ended up grabbing them and all the the guano as well. And that's how he got off of that island. But in his obituary, <clears throat> he said if he was given a choice between going to prison in upstate New York or being back on that island, he'd choose prison. So I'm expecting that it's basically just a little flat island with no trees and just tons of birds. And I can imagine how miserable that would have been, uh, especially back then. But in any way, or in any event, the plan is to be able to sight that island. Uh, I've had that sort of dream in my head for a long, long time. Um, and now I actually have the tools, and by that I mean Mighty Sparrow, to be able to actually get out there and see the island the way an island really should be seen, and that is to slowly come up over the horizon and and get a glimpse from a boat. I don't really have a huge amount of drive to get on the island because, one, I think you're not supposed to go there. Uh, It's a U.S. territory or something like that. Not that there's going to be... Excuse me. Not that there's going to be any sort of law enforcement parked out there, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it it um, it's not so much actually standing on the island; it's just sighting the island. There's something about that that I've always really enjoyed. Uh, whenever I'm on other trips, passing by, I mean, I barely got to see it, but Amsterdam Island in the Indian Ocean, I got to sight that one. And um, what was the other really cool one? Uh, I think it's called Trinidade, and that's down in the South Atlantic off the coast of Brazil, way, way off. Uh, That island was cool. I got within five miles of that one, I think, and that was pretty neat. And just, you know, various other islands, seeing the Azores, seeing some of the Cape Verde. Oh, no, I didn't didn't see any of the Cape Verdes. It was too, uh, too much Sahara dust in there. But in any event, yeah, seeing, seeing the island would be really cool, but... Essentially, that leaves me in a position where if I wanted to then sort of recreate his trip in a way, uh, if I want to head right back to Cape Horn, I have two options. I can worm my way through all the islands and just head directly south into the Southern Ocean and then catch the westerlies. Or what I plan on doing is to then proceed north and go west of the Hawaiian island chain go up all the way up until I'm catching the westerlies, you know, near the Aleutian Islands, and then cruise across back towards the States and get as close as I can, then start ducking down and kind of cruise the coast, you know, still a few hundred miles off, I'm sure, and and then head for Cape Horn, which would be definitely a late 
um, time to go around Cape Horn, but at least I'm going the correct way. So, and I, I have done that once before. And so I kind of know what to expect, but at the same time, I mean, with a place like that, you can really never know. I mean, there's, there's a difference between a boat like mine and, uh, a boat like, uh, an emote, uh, uh, you know, one of the Vendee Globe boats or something like that. I mean, those guys can rip around there and use the system perfectly. I basically am just putting myself in the danger zone for about two weeks and hoping, hoping I don't get some monster gale that just comes and swallows me whole. So back around into the Atlantics and then cruising back up. So I'm, when I'm charted out, it looks to be somewhere between 25 and 30,000 miles. So very comparable to the trip around the world in 2017. So I'm expecting, you know, nine to 10 months, something like that. But it also sort of just depends on how far north I go in the Pacific and how long that stretch takes because, you know, the, these islands sit right on the equator and, you know, that's sort of doldrumy area. You never know. I won't have a huge fuel bladder this time, which is very nice. I'm looking forward to that. I mean, the, the boat only holds, I think I'll have 65 gallons of diesel on board. So motoring is is not an option. I'm basically just just able to run the engine uh, to charge the batteries now and again. But um Eventually, yeah, you get up there and uh, and then make that turn and come back around. So I think it'd be a pretty cool voyage. You know, it's something a little bit different. And um, I don't know. I, I Definitely epic, I mean, for sure. There's some, some pretty scary spots. But I do think along the way being able to sight some of the other islands as well. You know, obviously I would want to go and cruise past Easter Island. I think that would be really interesting, especially if I could figure out which side of the island has the the best viewing for those statues. I mean, that would be probably one of the most amazing sights uh, to see from a boat. And then, you know, some of those, uh, some of the the rock outcrops way, way west of the Hawaiian chain, you know, there's the French frigate shoals. There's all sorts of stuff out there. It's steeped in history. Um, the captain of the, the whale ship Essex, he, uh, he had another, position as a captain of the the two brothers i believe and they wrecked that over on the french frigate shoals so i know there's a couple rocks and things like that but um i don't know just just cool areas and when when i look at a chart of the world there's a huge gaping hole uh where i don't have a single track and that's all in the pacific north of you know 40 degrees south so i mean my trip was pretty much in the southern ocean the whole time and i'd really like to chalk that one up and uh sort of check that off the list so we'll sort of see uh how how it all goes right now it's crazy to think but basically this whole uh everything rides on uh what, what cryptocurrency does sad to say but um yeah, it's it's where most of my holdings are, and I'm hoping that uh, it just has one final big push. Right now, I think I can do it on a shoestring, but um, if we get a little a little bull run going over the next few days, then I'm going to be sitting pretty. So <clears throat> keep your fingers crossed on that one. But preparations have gone pretty well with the boat. Luckily, you know, I I prepped this thing like crazy for the last trip, which ended up being one of the longest motoring boring trips I've ever been on. I mean, I only saw heavy weather, I think twice, maybe three times on that, on that voyage. And it was all easy stuff. So pretty much, uh, don't have to do a whole lot to the boat. I did, you know, mostly it's just wear and tear. So varnish work and a little fiberglass here and there. Um, but updating all the systems, getting everything, working and having all the spare parts that I need. So getting all that stuff ordered and done, ordered a bunch of charts today, which is pretty cool. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, because it's, that's one of the nice parts because it's all, or the vast majority of it's all open ocean sailing, you know, the charts that I already have on board, all 15 of them or whatever is, is just about suitable for, (laughs) for almost the entire voyage. But I do want to get in close to some of these, these islands. So I'm, I'm getting sort of specific charts for those areas. 
But uh, I've got the rigger. He's coming. A guy named Larique. Uh, he's. We're gonna switch out the force day because that is actually the original one that I went around the world on, and it's getting a little little age on it. So replacing that and getting all the spare parts for some of the rest of the rig. I luckily still have all this spare wire that I can use to replace stuff if it starts to let go. But I need some of the the stay lock fittings and the, the endings and things like that to be able to hook it all up. So uh, I got an extra, extra solar panel. I don't know. I, I could go down this whole crazy list, but right now one of my big focuses is trying to collect as many books and uh, podcasts and all that sort of stuff that I possibly can. Cause stuff is like gold when you're out there. So my my brother Adam, who's I'm sure going to be helping me with the weather, he's going to uh, he's hooking me up with a nice MP3 player that's just fully loaded. I don't know how many gigabytes of of information, but it's going to be oh godsend. But yeah, so I'm I've uh, you know every day I'm looking at this Amazon <laughs> cart and oh man, it's so expensive, and I'm just waiting patiently to be able to just click enter and uh and not have to worry about it anymore but uh, a lot of the stuff will be able to just get here in rockland so so that's pretty cool but uh there are there are a few few other things that i definitely need but it's kind of interesting you know normally uh beyond the food one of the most important things is to is to set up a suitable bar on the boat and i think though this trip the bar is going to actually be the the last the last thing that i purchase basically whatever money i have left over <laughs> before i go is all going to go straight to uh whatever alcohol supplies i can afford so should be kind of interesting normally i put a higher uh, emphasis on that but you know this time just got to do what i got to do but uh yeah, I'm. I have already on board like eight months or something like that worth of long life food, which does not taste good. It's not fun to cook. It's you know a lot of pastas and oatmeal's and rices and all sort of dishes. So that was from the first or the second trip because I didn't have to really use it. But uh, I think the vast majority of the rest of the food that I'm going to get is just cans and. You know, things like that, tuna, ravioli, soups, um, beans, all that all that sort of stuff. Um, I am lucky I've got a lot of that green powder stuff um, to be able to sort of supplement some actual decent nutrients into my body. Because that's, that's one of the tough things with the ocean travel. It's a food, man. It's just, I mean, you're basically eating preservatives and that's about it just to be able to make that stuff last as long as it can. But, you know, it is what it is. At least it's available because, I don't know, back in the day you would have been, it would have been salted pork. <laughs> and that does not sound good. Salted pork and hardtack. Mmm, delicious. Although some of the MRE, I have these MRE pizza slices and they're so god awful. Uh, I've they've been on the boat for years, and they're so oh, they're so bad. But I equate that to having to eat hardtack, and uh, eventually, I'm sure I'll eat all of them. But uh, not without being a little bit angry while I do it. So that's sort of my update at this point. <clears throat> oh man, I'm hoarse. I've been the allergies. For some reason, I don't know what it is. Usually by this time in in the year, allergies are sort of a, uh, they're all gone. I don't ever have think about it. But, man, they've been killing my eyes, just going off, and my nose running like crazy. Ugh, but it is starting to sort itself out. It was like three days ago. It was really, really bad. But, um, yeah, so I don't know. Other than that, basically got to. Got the bottom sanded. Like I have all this stuff prepped, uh, but it's 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 a little too far out to do certain things. Um, I don't know. Right, right now, though, the the projects basically that I'll be working on. Well, I guess just today, I need to do some fiberglass work on one of the scuppers that's uh, been a leaking issue on the boat for many many years. And I've already ground that all down, and now I just need to glass it and then paint it. And hopefully that will actually take care of that one. 
because it leaks directly into the cupboard in the galley. And I've basically never been able to put any sort of food in there unless it's in a jar or something like that. And so I'm sort of looking forward to fixing that one. Um, engine works pretty good. Do have a little problem with fuel getting into the oil, but uh, I think I fixed it with the new lift pump, but um, I don't know. It's one of those things where you never really know, but luckily, you know, I'll, I'll have enough oil to do an oil change or two. Uh, but again, I mean, I, you know, I'm only running the thing. I, I'm only going to have one tank of gas, so I don't see it being a huge issue uh, if for whatever reason I can't, uh, can't use that. But there's worse things, you know, you could be losing the oil out of the engine. So that's never a good thing. But um, <clears throat> Alex said, ordered charts. I've got all the, the almanacs so that I can use the sextant as much as I can. Got a lot of tools. I was able to find a spare mast uh, that I was able to pull stuff off of and sort of scavenge got a bunch of halyards uh some blocks and some really heavy duty turnbuckles so i have some good replacements and that to me is like gold um and i need to build i'm building a new bunk uh in the boat so essentially down below in sparrow you've got the center walkway uh in the middle and when i'm out at sea on uh, the port side is kind of like a little twin bed. That's my bunk. And then um, in the past, on the starboard side, I've built a huge cabinet from floor to ceiling that it houses all the food and spare parts and this, that, and the other thing. And this time, I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to build sort of half of it. Excuse me. So it'll be a little bit of a... It'll be a tiny uh, extra bunk, so another twin, but it's going to be on top of a big storage unit as well. So kind of get the best of both worlds. But my thinking behind that is that I have always had so much trouble sleeping, or at least not sleeping, but getting a good night's sleep uh, on whenever I'm having to sleep on the high side of the boat when we're healing over. If I can be on the low side, I can just sort of, burrow into it and then I'm all good but um you know uh there's going to be a lot of time on this trip where I'm healed over to the other side and so I figured you know huh, why not I'll just build this thing still be able to house a bunch of stuff uh but more importantly I'll I'll have I'll have better sleeping conditions uh than I have on any of the voyages before and I think it's going to be a pretty big game changer it's going to be a little more difficult to stow and stash stuff, but I kind of, my plan is not to just always have two bunks set up, but um, I'm going to get some crates, storage crates that I can then lash down. So out on the ocean, typically if you're on one tack and the boat's leaning over to one side, it's going to be like that for a long time. Like sometimes it's weeks, sometimes it's a month. So what I'm going to do is have these crates that are filled with all sorts of food and all that sort of stuff, and I'll be able to lash those into the bunk that's on the high side and uh, and then just flip-flop it. So if I end up leaning the other way, then I'll just switch the bunk to the other side and vice versa. You get it. Um, so that's sort of my game plan. We're going to test that theory out when we get out there. Yeah, But in my mind, it seems to make a lot of sense. But uh, a lot of things do and turn out <laughs> the exact opposite way. But I don't know. I'm. It's kind of crazy because over the last few weeks, it's just been just financially the most stressful time. Uh, just watching, you know, these markets do their thing and just drop. And I'm all I'm seeing is my trip disappearing, getting further away, and then. Now suddenly we're in October. It's it's already starting to creep back up, so I'm starting to see more of the light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, yeah, no, for I would say today is probably the first day that I am just super excited. Um, I'm I'm feeling way less doubt in what's going to happen and much more anticipation and involvement. Like I'm. I, that's why I'm even doing this podcast. Cause I'm just, I'm excited. Like I'm, 
I am ready to to get on it because I mean before it was one of those things where I I was having trouble motivating myself to do some of this stuff because I'm thinking, well, I'm probably not even going to be able to go on this. This is ridiculous. But then I did eventually. I came up with a sort of like a plan plan D, so to speak, where you know if I if if I wasn't going to be able to afford everything I needed for the big trip, round Cape Horn, all that sort of stuff. Um, I was just going to do a figure eight in the Atlantic, uh, where I basically take off, go down and go all the way down, you know, just touch the Southern ocean sort of thing. And then work my way back up, take it easy trip like that. You don't need a whole huge amount of supplies. You get back down South somewhere after like four or five months at sea. And, uh, you know, mostly trade wind sailing doldrums, no big deal. Um, and, even though it is dangerous, you know, and shouldn't be attempted, you know, if you if you haven't <clears throat> done that sort of stuff. But for me, that that sounds like it'd be a nice, nice way to spend some time and, uh, you know, read a lot of books and stuff like that. So that was sort of the plan D. And that got me at least a little excited. And who knows? Plan D may become plan A if uh, things go terribly wrong all of a sudden. But I think I'm pretty positive. I think we're going to be I think we're going to be a okay, um, and I'm I'm trying not to let the anxiety of of heading again down to Cape Horn sort of freak me out. I'm already sort of entering that zone that I found myself in on the first trip, where I started just focusing on the day, one day at a time. List my projects out, list my goals for that day. Don't consider the rest of it. Um, I mean consider it but don't sit there and worry about it because one you miss out on the day that you're on and two you're not doing yourself any favors so i'm already getting in the right mindset and everything and um yeah just basically i mean right now sitting at the the table here and just looking at list after list after list of of things that need to be purchased or completed or looked into and uh it's actually yeah, pretty manageable. I think it's it's doable. I mean, there's basically I got three weeks or just under three weeks to get all this done, and uh, yeah, luckily I got all the sail repairs done over the last three or four days. And uh, oh my gosh, I mean, I like doing sail repairs, but it's kind of a pain to do them when you have to do them in the in the inside of the boat, but it's way easier on land when the boat's not moving. So went through and, and restitched a bunch of the big sails and then uh, patched up some spots that just had a little bit of wear on them on the main sail. But uh, some of those sails have, you know, like 60,000 miles on them, which is crazy, but they're still in great shape. Um, I attribute that to my older brother, Sven, who, Basically made some of the best sales I've ever seen in my life. Still, still crispy. They don't stretch, and uh, they give you a certain amount of confidence that uh, I've never had in a sale before. I mean, I've. It's so funny because when you get out there and like it really starts to blow, and you're you're uh, hove to, and it's just boats heeled over. You've got a, just a scrap of storm jib, and you've got this teeny reefed main and boat's still healing over you feel all the pressure and the wind is just all night all day and it goes on day i day after day and you're just looking at those sails you're like how can they take it and they do they do and they they've done it so many times it's crazy um you know i i've always gotten the comment when people see some of the videos of of me running in the southern ocean you know mainsail just flat against the the shrouds and uh barely any chafe. I mean, I've, I've learned now to throw a little gorilla tape on there. And then, you know, if you, after a few months, you just have to switch it up, but it's pretty amazing how strong those sales have been and how well they've worked. So the inventory is pretty good right now, but I am looking to get, I need a spinnaker and I need, I'd like to get a giant drifter, a really light, lightweight one. And then if I could, I'd love to find a sort of a medium-sized jib, but uh, that might be asking a little much. I think it's just going to be the drifter and the spinnaker. 
are going to be what's going to get me through some of that light wind stuff. So we shall see. Uh, I'm going on bacon sales here later this afternoon, try and find them. The goal, the goal for this weekend really is to finalize any ordering. Um, I'm slowly, uh, turning crypto into regular currency and I can only do so much. I can only withdraw so much each day. So basically doing that. And then hopefully by Monday, I will be able to order all the last little bits, which will probably, I'm estimating most stuff to take two weeks to get here. So it's going to be one of those things where I've, I essentially am going to have two weeks to do whatever projects I need to. And then um, that last week before I leave is going to be all just provisioning and stowing and lashing and getting every last little thing ready, uh, and then going for it. So it's definitely last minute, but unfortunately it's just sort of had to, had to be that way, but I don't know. I, I usually work pretty good under pressure, so I'm not too, not too worried about it. I know when push comes to shove, that's when, uh, you know, you can work 18, 20 hours in a day and, and accomplish a huge, huge amount of stuff. But the trick is not to get any sort of anxiety over it and freak out and think, uh, you know, the world's crashing down on you because it's not. It's not. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. Other than that, I don't have too much uh, too much else to say, and I actually don't have too much time to talk because I do have to uh, – get into some of these other projects, but I, I'm hoping to be able to do a few more interviews while I'm here, if I got the time and if I can get these guys to actually sit down and talk to me. And, uh, but if not, I, I found that I can archive the podcast, so I don't have to have to shut it down. I'm just going to archive it so that it's still up there. And then when I get back after 10 months or whatever, I'll, I'll probably have a, a whole bunch of episodes and uh, dive into that sort of stuff. But I am going to be working with the MS Foundation this time on this trip, and they're going to put together a fundraising page for me. So not for me, but for them uh, about me. And um, basically, that's going to be one of the number one ways to follow along on the trip. I'll have daily reports and uh, be able to see the position and all that sort of stuff and may have a buddy of mine take over my TikTok account and just do an update, uh, you know, every so often on there just to keep people in the loop. But uh, I don't know. I, I don't have Facebook anymore. And uh, that used to be sort of the go to, but uh, not anymore. So uh, I don't know. We'll We'll sort of figure it out. But I figure, you know, anybody that's really interested in it, they'll figure it out. And I don't know. I, it's nice to be able to share this uh, with a bunch of people, but at the same time, I mean, it's really not all about that. And I'm happy to share once I get back and do presentations and stuff. So we shall see. But uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'll try and do a few more updates along the way. Um, they might only just be this little half hour thing. But uh, yeah, hopefully, fingers crossed for me out there, everybody. And uh, hopefully we'll... We'll get going and everything will be a, a nice success and uh, we get launched and then we go. I'm trying to figure out whether or not I'm going to leave from Rockland, from Gloucester, from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, or try and make it all the way down to Newport, Rhode Island. So, I don't know. We'll see. I think the weather is going to dictate that 100% because, you know, Gloucester and uh, Portsmouth, they're a day or less away. So, that's pretty easy. Boston, that could be one as well. Um, Newport is kind of tricky because that's that's a bit of a jaunt. Um, that's like two days, three days maybe to get down there, depending on the weather. So I don't know. We'll have to see. Who knows? Maybe you get the, a nice northerly for two, three days, get down to Newport, and uh, and then the southwesterly comes, and I just ride that straight out. But the only problem with Newport, I'm thinking, is that you know, leaving there, you are leaving a super high traffic area. But I guess, you know, with Gloucester, it's the same because you're headed towards George's Bank, and that's crazy traffic. There really aren't any uh, any easy evacs uh, right out to the Atlantic Ocean, at least not this far north. So they've all got their pitfalls. I'll update everybody on that later. <laughs> But for now, I uh, hope everybody has a good day. Thanks for listening, and uh, yeah, I'll keep you updated.
Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. And if you enjoy the podcast and want to support it, just go to podbean.com and you can become a patron and keep the show on the air. Also, if you like the music at the beginning, the album is called Deep Teal and the artist is Adrian Edson. It's available on Amazon Music. And if you want the full story of the trip around the world, the book, the Kindle book, and the audio book can all be found on Amazon.com, Sailing Into Oblivion, The Solo Nonstop Voyage of the Mighty Sparrow. Fair winds and following seas.